Okay, hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Bitter Pill, a show where we talk about bitter pills of truth that people don't want to hear about, but uh, they probably should hear about them because, uh, you know, if we know about, uh, you know, unpleasant realities about the world, so maybe we can do something about them. Uh, so today I have a, a guest on my show, uh, Dr. Bob Sinclair, uh, a uh, social psychologist like myself uh, from uh, Canada, uh, somewhere there in the great white north of uh, Ontario. Um, and uh, so, so we're going to talk today about uh, you know, the COVID-19 uh, situation and uh, it, some of the issues around uh, how we can address it. And, uh, you know, you might wonder, well, like, okay, so we're doctors, but we're not that kind of doctor. Um, you know, we're not, you know, medical professionals. We're not biologists. We're not epidemiologists. So what the Thank hell God. would a social psychologist, uh, why, why should anybody listen to what a social psychologist has to do about a public health issue? Um, what, what do you say to that, Bob? Well, you know, uh, 98% of, in North America, we've deified medical doctors, okay? Yeah. But 98% of medical doctors are not scientists. And, and so they don't do research. So a good doctor is good at diagnostic problem solving. Right. And a bad doctor is not, okay? <laughs> exactly. And it, so it's similar to a good plumber versus a bad plumber uh -huh. and a good electrician versus a bad electrician. And okay. people seem to think that their doctors are scientists and most doctors out there couldn't do an experiment to save their own lives. Um, now, in the and, and the thing about, about people like you and, and me is that because we deal with people as our participants in our research, we understand research methodology and experimental design and quasi-experimental design more than most people out there. I remember I published a paper in Nature in 2000. Uh, um, and the people who, who would like send me these emails and yell at me were medical doctors because mm -hmm. they were complaining that the number of participants I had were so low. Well, these mm -hmm. are guys that are used to getting reports that they don't understand some, the methods of anyway, <laughs> right. and yeah. they don't understand the statistics from drug companies who are testing the effect of their new drug that they want to sell to the public against the gold standard okay and and they use like hundreds of thousands of participants in their research mm -hmm. because it turns out that the new drug doesn't really have a really big difference mm -hmm. better than the gold standard so mm -hmm. you have to have hundreds you know 200,000 people in your study yeah, to find a statistically significant effect yeah. which means the effect isn't very big and you might as well just use the gold standard instead of the new drug and the big pharma just wants to get the doctors to prescribe the new drug and the right. doctors don't get what's going on with the data um, and you know my dad my dad was a, a a medical doctor and he was a good one he was very yeah, good at mine was too actually and he would he would never say that he was a scientist. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, and so there's two percent of them out there, and uh, who are scientists and they work at research hospitals, mm -hmm. and yeah. they don't use two hundred thousand people in their in their experiments. Yeah, you don't need to. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, and they understand experimental design not quite as well as we do, uh, but. But they do, yeah. and the, the the issue that I have with epidemiologists is that the epidemiologists uh, use unreliable data and invalid assumptions to create models. So here's a problem. You know, they talk about this curve. Well, the curve, in my opinion, is a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, in a paper that I wrote, I quoted Shakespeare. It's the first time I got to, to quote Shakespeare in a, <laughs> uh, 
scientific paper. I said, yeah, the curve is a tale told by an idiot, full, full of sound and fury and signifying nothing. Pardon, yeah. pardon me. Signifying nothing. There's no and in there. And that's from Macbeth's soliloquy upon the death of Lady Macbeth. <laughs> anyway, I don't think the epidemiologists are going to like me much. But the, the point is this. Here's yeah, I, how they're I trying have, to... Uh, your paper pulled up here, by the way. Um, okay. So. What they're doing is they're... They're, you've got people who show symptoms, so you test them, and yeah, they're positive. Then you got people on the front line, and they're more likely to get COVID-19, mm -hmm. and so more of them is positive. And then you just got the kind of people who want to go in and get tested. Well, those you put those three those three groups together. That's not representative of our population. Okay, yes. this is a biased sample. Exactly. So, um, uh, and there's absolutely no way that we're going to test 100% of the population. So why don't we think outside of the box, like, and the epidemiologists don't like to do this because all they like to do is create models, right? Yeah, so uh, how, well, but, just, uh, I'm curious, like, if, if they're not uh, doing proper science sampling, like, how are they coming up with these estimates of what the infection rates are? Because, okay, so they test X number of people and they find that, you know, uh, two million of them or whatever come back positive and then they come up with this estimate okay we think there are 20 million infected how the hell did they come up with that number well i mean you, you and i are, are speaking the same language here so the people that are listening i mean essentially for the for the for the people that just want to understand this from a, a to, like a, if you were one of my research methodology students it'd be look uh, the sample's biased because they're, they're so you're only looking at the people who, the number of infections that you've counted, and you're using that as a proxy measure for number of infections across the country or across mm -hmm. yeah. uh, a world or whatever. Well, that's those data aren't objective. They're unreliable. They don't make any sense. They're not repeatable. They're, they're, they're nonsense. Right. And, and so... So, so what the only objective measure that we have right now available to us are deaths yeah, per million objective. because it's, you know, uh, although in the United States, it looks like death rates have been being inflated and in the rest of the world, they've been un underreported, but regardless, it, they're the most objective data that we have. Look, right. you count the number of dead people, and you divide it by the population of the country, and you, you know, get deaths per million. And, uh, and, and that's that the, the, you can actually come up with a real curve there, and the real curve goes up, 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 because deaths per millions increase, and then eventually it levels off and it doesn't increase very much. Now, deaths right. per million always have to increase because they're a cumulative measure, right? They can't decrease right. unless, you, unless you're a necromancer and you can raise, <laughs> raise the debt. Yeah. Um, so when we talk about flattening so, the curve, that's what we mean is the rate of increase slows down. Um, it's got to. And see, yeah. see the, the epidemiologists aren't talking about the right curve. So, so how do we actually get around that? And Jeff and I both know, uh, but uh, the, the answer is we think outside of the box and the epidemiologists haven't. And what you do is you borrow methodology from other areas of science and social science, which both Jeff and I have done throughout our careers as, uh, as research scientists. And you look at things like these guys that are experts in public opinion polling. Look, they can predict the outcome of an election within three percentage points um, using 396, doing a random sample of 396 people in the United States, okay? Yeah. Uh, so, so if yeah. you're talking um, about president, right, okay, you got two choices. Well, you, usually you have two choices. Sometimes there's a third thrown in there, like, you know, Ross Perot. Um, but, uh, you know, um, why don't we use that approach with COVID-19? Okay, because and I, uh, 
sorry to interrupt you, but I just wanted to uh, address an objection that people might have. They might say, like, well, look, uh, most of the polls were predicting that Hillary Clinton would win in 2016, and she didn't. So how can we trust polls? And you know, the answer uh, is wait, 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 the wait, polls wait, were wait, very wait, close wait. to predicting what happened. You know, the, the, you know the, the, but but she did win the popular vote. Right, right. I mean, it, it's just like she won the popular vote. Yeah. And so when we're talking about COVID nineteen, there's no electoral college involved. Okay, <laughs> uh, yes. it's like it's you know what you either have it or you don't, and that's it. End of story. Right. So 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 what you do so so what the public opinion if you use that method. The error variability, so the noise in the system, is much smaller when you're testing for COVID-19 than it is when you're asking people who they're going to vote for. Right. Because people change their mind between the time that they're polled and the time that they vote. But COVID-19 doesn't change its mind. You, well, have you, know, you do have to take into account the reliability of the test. But oh, yeah, yeah, for people sure. probably change but, your opinions uh, and, more and than also, tests you know. You guys, you guys have been using this test that, that was developed by Abbott, and the CDC said, look at it, it's given us a bunch of false negatives. Were you in a, in a pandemic situation, you want false positives. You're more, right. you, you'd be more, you'd more likely want to say, yes, the person's infected when they're not, okay, rather than say they're not infected when they are, to yeah. be more safe in a pandemic situation. So, um, but anyway... If we if we use that strategy, random sample testing. Now in Canada, uh, I'd suggest that we do like fifteen hundred people every two weeks. Okay, and I've mm -hmm. been yelling at the government about this for since the beginning of the pandemic, and like nobody pays any attention. Uh, mm -hmm. It managed to make it to our prime minister's desk, and then my paper, and then from the prime minister's desk, it managed to make it to the minister of health. Uh, so that's at the federal level. Um, and, uh, and then it died there in, you know, a pile of papers, I suppose. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, uh, it's the most objective measure that we have. So, um, if if you look at it across the world, which I've been doing, and I kind of, after I published the paper, I stopped updating as often as I did. I mean, I initially started doing this just looking at Canada versus the U.S., mm -hmm. and then I started throwing in a few other countries, okay? And, and I started going, whoa, we're not looking so good here. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if you, let me put this up. I had it sitting up in front of me. Yeah, I remember you were bragging about Canada for a while, and then you stopped bragging. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, you know what? Every, all these judgment, judgments are relative. Canada was doing a much better job than the United States, but that's damning with faint praise. <laughs> so uh, so um, if you look at places like Italy, Spain, France... Uh, Sweden, the UK, they're all terrible. You know, the UK is over 655 deaths per million right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the United States, uh, the United States, oh, just a sec, I got to decline this. And I got to, I don't know why that came through. I had my do not disturb on. Um Anyway, the United States is way up there, too, with 447. Uh, and, you know, that's a lot. This, these, I looked at these data yesterday. Uh, Canada's got 235. And the, the province that I live in, which is like a state, uh, if we considered it its own country, it would be 184 deaths per million. Quebec, which is another province, again, which is like a state, if we treated it like its own country, it would be the worst in the world. 666 deaths per million. 666. No, that's more uh, than the UK. So, uh, yeah, that'd be worse than the UK. Uh, so, so anyhow, I think, well, the last time I looked, the UK was about 650 or something. Um, but that might be higher today. It probably is. Now, 
Then when you look at the, at the numbers, they drop down. Germany, 110. Well, that's a big drop from 230. It's actually 236 today in Canada, down to 110. And even if you look at between Ontario and treat it as a, as, a, as, a, as a country by itself, 184 deaths per million dropping down to 110 is still a big drop. And then it continues to go down. I'm not going to list all the countries that I paid attention to, but these are from uh, yesterday and today. Germany, 110 deaths per million. Denmark, 106. Egypt, 35. India, 23. And here's, here's the reason why relying on number of positives as, as a proxy measure for infection rate is useless because look at India has almost 1.4 billion people there. So yeah, you know, I mean, look at Trump said one thing was right. If you test more and more people, you're going to find more and more cases. Then right. he said, it said the really stupid thing was don't <laughs> test more people. Okay? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so anyway, um, you know, these numbers are an artifact, of, of a measurement artifact. Right. So, so uh, it's highly likely that Brazil has more infections than the United States, right? Because they're not doing nearly as many tests, so they don't yeah, really... Yeah, but I've, I've been looking at deaths per million, and yeah. at least with their reported numbers, they're below the United States. They're oh, okay. between the U.S. and Canada. Uh, but look, at none of us are good. And none of us, none of us and, and, and like most of Western Europe... Uh, well, most of, of, of the more Western side of Western Europe, as opposed to the more uh, the, the countries that practice even more democratic socialism, uh, uh, did poorly. And part of it was they just weren't prepared. And there mm -hmm. was no excuse for the United States or Canada not to be prepared, okay? We saw this coming. We didn't shut down our borders quickly enough. And Canada made the biggest mistake by not shut, shutting the border between Canada and the U.S. immediately. Right. Okay, Because things were starting to skyrocket there. And like our borders were open. This is just this was just absolute lunacy on the part of our government. Yeah. Um, so Eastern European countries, you know, you've got like Ukraine. And they shut down. They they went. You know, all these countries that are doing well just shut down their borders. Uh, right. Ukraine uh, has got about 17 deaths per million, uh, and Romania has got about 19. Uh, Philippines yesterday 17 deaths per million. Cuba eight deaths per million. Nigeria four deaths per million. Thailand has been sitting at less than one death per million for the last three months. Right. Okay, and um, uh, Taiwan has been sitting at less than uh, one death per million for the last several months. Mm -hmm. Vietnam and Malaysia have zero, zero, okay? zero deaths, absolutely none. And all of these countries that just shut down their borders, Bangladesh, same thing, shut down their borders. Okay, they're doing fine, and um, we're not. Yeah. And well, we're doing fine are except for tourism. These are, <laughs> these are objective measures. I mean, it, it's hard to argue with them, okay, too much. You can say, yeah, well, some overestimate, some estimate, underestimate, but you know what? Those are, that's error variance as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah. And that, you know, when you, you look at a place like Cuba, you know, Cuba, they're still shut down because right. they're importing food now, but they're not. They're, you can't go there. Well, you guys can anyway, but mm -hmm. they have a big tourist industry. Actually, tourism, as you and I were spot speaking about before we started doing the actual presentation here, is tourism is one of the industries that has been just massively killed by COVID-19. Yeah. Um, so, so... Uh, yeah, even, and even places like Venezuela, I forget exactly what their numbers are. Um, we can look it up maybe, but uh, you know they don't have very many cases, and that's or deaths, and that's despite the fact that you know, they don't have adequate medical supplies because you know there's this embargo going on against them, but they're still doing yeah. fine. Then look at yeah, us. Yeah, no, I actually read, 
I ran those numbers. I ran those numbers uh, earlier because I have a friend who's Venezuelan, but got out when the sort of you know what hit the storm there, and she's living in Colombia, which she doesn't like very much. Mm -hmm. uh, and Colombia's got good numbers too, but the embargo actually probably helped Venezuela because nobody's in, nobody's out. Right. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> you know, you know, you're isolated. Unfortunately, you have to, you know, when you're paying for things, they just weigh your money now because, uh, you know, inflation is so high. Uh, but if we'd been doing ra random sample testing, we'd know exactly the infection rate. We'd know exactly the percentage of the population who is asymptomatic and walking around shedding the virus. We'd know exactly what areas to target, to do more targeted testing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and nobody gets it. Yeah, and, and we would also, is, we would have a compelling response to these people who say, oh, look at, uh, you know, it's just like a bad flu, you know, there's not that, you know, there's, uh, you know, all these cases we don't know about, so the death rate's probably not much worse than seasonal flu. And, you know, if you had the objective numbers, if you had a random sample, and you, you could say, okay, look, there's only five times as many infected people, or whatever it is, than uh, the number that have t actually tested positive. Um, you know, you could say, no, look, it's really <laughs> killing a lot of people, in spite of the fact that we've shut down the economy and people are wearing masks and all this stuff. You know, we've still had like three times as many deaths from COVID in the United States as we have in a typical flu season despite all the measures we've taken to stop it. Um, well, but, the other thing is that if you did it every two weeks, you could actually tell whether you're having any impact on, on infection rates. Because right. you know, here's yeah. the infection rate. We know it. We did this survey. We know it. Okay, yeah. And then yeah. two weeks later, you do it. And if the infection rate's going down, then you know you're having an effect. And if it's staying steady or going up, you know you're not having an effect. Right. So... Make things so a lot basically, easier. And, and then in the U.S., in the U.S., what's happening is you've got these like third rate epidemiologists who've been selling their souls for money. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what they do is, you know, one set is hired by the Republicans. Another set, you know, they're a guy, one consulting firm who's epidemiolo epidemiological consulting. What they do is and are hired by the Democrats. And so the ones hired by the Republicans use one set of assumptions, and that says, oh, we'll reopen the economy. And the ones hired by the Democrats use a different set of assumptions, mm -hmm. and they say, oh, no, 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 keep the economy closed. Mm -hmm. So now the, now the epidemiologists have become political, political – the epidemiologists have been drawn in to this political I issue. And I'm going to slap the CDC and Health Canada and a bunch of other places here because what happens is, is that most but not all of the scientists who don't uh, – who work for the government – um, are doing so because they weren't good enough to get academic jobs, okay? <laughs> and and so you've got second or third rate epidemiologists, and it varies from area to area because the virologists who are working for the CDC are some of the top notch virologists in the world, okay? Mm -hmm. But um, but you've got epidemiologists who really dark, you know, I, I, I had a line in this paper and I took it out, but the, the line said, with a PhD in epidemiology and $4.50, you should be able to get yourself a latte, sit in a corner, keep your mouth shut, and let the real scientists do their work. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, as I said, they're not going to like me much. But, but um, we'd know what's going on. And the problem is... The people that are, are doctors that are, are specialists in specialists in infectious diseases and who also understand research are relying on their subordinates who are the epidemiologists who are, in my opinion, not all of them, 
but most of them really terrible scientists. Mm -hmm. And they're advising the CDC, they're advising Health Canada, they're advising the public health in my province, okay? Mm -hmm. So idiots are advising the head honchos, and they're not doing the right research. Well, do and you then, think that actually, have... last week I read, finally I read, they're going to do a study coming out, out of one of the research hospitals in Toronto, across Canada, random sample survey, 10,000 participants. I went, 10,000 participants. This is what happens when when medical doctors do research, okay? You mm. don't need 10,000 participants. No. And, and I said, I actually wrote this guy, and I said, why don't you do this? Why don't you just do 1500 every week or every two weeks, okay, right. when you're blowing your $10,000? Yeah, so exactly. So you, you know what's you know, going on. It's like and, one and shot on top study, all, then you can't track just, it over time. And, and, and what they're doing is they're just looking at COVID-19 antibodies. Well, we mm -hmm. know that COVID-19 antibodies actually disappear ra rather quickly. Why mm -hmm. the hell aren't they just measuring COVID-19 too? They could do this. They, they, this is really, these are really easy data to collect. You send it out. There are, you know, you swab your nose once and you swab your nose again, and it all goes back to a lab. You could even include, we'd, obviously you'd include some demographic questions. I'd suggest including a few attitudinal questions, mm -hmm. like about mask use and about, you know, people's perceptions mm -hmm. of, of transmittability and this kind of stuff. And it'd be, they'd be beautiful data. But no, what they're doing is they're making a sow zero out of a silk purse. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, take something that's like perfectly good and just ruin it. Uh, and, uh, I, I'm astonished every day. Yeah. Um, yeah. so my, my, my opinion is though, that number one, we're reopening the economy too quickly. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, that this isn't over and it's not going to be over for a while. Uh, number three, the people that are comparing it to the flu, there are a couple of issues there. First of all, COVID-19 is more related to the common cold. It's not a flu virus. It's a mm -hmm. common Correct. Coronavirus, yeah. And there's no... There's, there's yeah, coronavirus is a mutated version of the yeah, common cold. But there's, there's no... We have no data, real data, about about influenza, we know more about COVID-19 and we could know even more if they did the right research mm -hmm. because the flu, they're just taking, these idiot epidemiologists are just taking guesses because right. nobody, there is no toe tag on any cadaver that says this person died of influenza. It's, it's right. sometimes and, kind of respiratory distress or pneumonia or whatever. It yeah. never says influenza. Yeah, and so we same. don't know a goddamn thing about the flu. Yeah, and so, we don't, probably the estimates of how many flu cases there are are even worse than the estimates of how many COVID cases there are. Exactly. You know, they're just taking wild guesses. Well, we don't test anybody for the flu. You know, nobody gets tested for the flu. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm hoping that one thing this virus does, though, as, as you know, the the dream about the usable vaccine with 18 months within 18 months that started eight months ago now so they got 10 more months to make their dream come true will actually make anti-vaxxers aware of the uh reasons that we actually have vaccines and maybe mm -hmm. we'll get more people going out and getting vaccinated because i know a lot of people who are uh have compri compromised immune systems and they're mm -hmm. young people with compromised immune systems, and they right. rely on herd on herd immunity right. to save them, right? And they're the ones that are really threatened right now by uh, COVID nineteen. Um, you know, interesting. An interesting comparison, though, is if you go back to um, the nineteen eighteen to nineteen twenty Spanish 
flu pandemic. Right. Yeah. There are some interesting parallels there. I don't want anybody to confuse this with me saying this is a flu because it's not. But there are right, some right. parallels there. Is we had no immunity and no vaccination for the Spanish flu. Okay. Mm-hmm. The estimate is that it killed between five and ten percent of the world's population. It spread like wildfire. Uh, now, there were only 1.8 billion people in the world in 1918. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, let me do some some quick math here. Uh, yeah, I don't I know what the population of the U.S. was then, but my, I seem to recall about 600,000 in the U.S. died from it. Uh, the estimated. But um, you know, do, you, do you know the story behind? Uh, let me just pull up here. That's in Ontario. I don't want Ontario. I want COVID-19 world. Um, okay, so... So they're saying, you know, about 645,000 deaths, okay? So let's mm-hmm. just do the quick math. Six four five zero zero zero. It's interesting. The U.S. data every day when I look at this, you get that they're just reporting round numbers now. Like you know, you know, one hundred fifty-five k. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's like everybody, every other country is you know four thousand three three hundred and thirty-six. In the U.S. is just about ah, one hundred fifty-five k uh, divided by eight, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, two, two. Okay, I just looked up. There were 100 okay. million people approximately in the U.S. in that era. So that's like, you know, more than half a percent okay, of the population. So, so far, COVID-19 has killed 0.008% of the world's population. Compare that to between the estimate of between 5 and 10% from the Spanish flu. Mm-hmm. Okay, so COVID-19 is is very contagious, but far less deadly. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, you know, now in raw numbers, it's a massive difference because we got 8 billion people now. Back then there was only 1.8 billion people, but relatively speaking, when you figure it out, okay, 0.008% as a point to, as between somewhere between 5 and 10%, that's a massive difference in terms mm-hmm. of, 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 of death rates. Um, and, uh, but, the other interesting comparison is that the Spanish flu killed old people, and then it dropped off, and then it killed 20 to 40 year olds, and then it dropped off, and then it killed kids, just like COVID-19. The same kind of death curve, if you believe the data, look at that that you can get your hands on from 1918 to 1920. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you really, if you knew the history of this, you probably do. Spanish flu actually originated in Kansas, uh, mm-hmm. um, and during World War One, they didn't want to demoralize the, the troops, and Spain was neutral. So what they did was they blamed it on the Spanish. When in fact it it was it, it was first uh, discovered on a military base in Kansas. Right. Yeah. And so it was the American flu instead of the Chinese flu. That <laughs> damn American flu took out. <laughs> Look at look at that Those Chinese flu is taking out point oh oh eight percent of the world's population. That American flu took out between five and ten percent of the of the yeah. the uh, population. Maybe Trump should start calling talking yeah. about the. Yeah, well, American China flu. did us a big favor <laughs> by. Yeah, China did us a big favor by being relatively successful at containing the virus. Uh, you know, that's probably a major well, reason for the difference. Although you know what. I, to be honest with you, there are two countries I have a hard time, because I've been looking at the data kind of across the world on, you know, sort of I randomly selected various countries, is I have a hard time believing the data coming out of China and I have a hard time believing believing the data coming out of Russia. Mm-hmm. And here's the reason. You know, China's almost got 2 billion people. And they're saying they only wow. had 38,000 deaths. I have a hard time buying 50 it. 50-something. And, and, no, and uh, Russia. 5,000, yeah. Uh, and Russia 
is reporting these massive infection rates and they're saying like, oh yeah, well, only 35 people have died or something. I'm exaggerating hyperbole on the, on the uh, a downward hyperbole on the death rates. But the bottom line is Russia's reporting death rates that just don't jive with the rest of the world. 13,000 okay. deaths. They're out of, okay, so their deaths per million is uh, reported to be 91 in Russia currently. Yeah. I call that, as they say in Japanese, bullshitsu. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't know if it's hard to know but uh, about any country's data, really, but, uh, you know, China took pretty drastic measures, and it's a, you know, it's a mask-wearing culture. You know, they dealt with SARS and all that, so people are, yeah. and pollution, so people are used to wearing masks in public. Um, yeah. And, uh you know, they strictly quarantine and they shut their borders and so forth. So, so I don't know. You know, those might be correct numbers. No, it, you know, I, you know, you put you, it could they could be real data. They could be. But I just I'm skeptical of things coming out of both Russia and China just in general. Mm -hmm. I'm more likely to trust trust uh, countries that aren't those countries. I mean, even like okay, look at you know, uh, Dutart isn't the nicest guy in the world. But he's not lying to the WHO, and it's pretty mm -hmm. obvious because their their rates are right in where they should be with the with these other countries, and and as I mentioned to you beforehand, none of the, none of these countries with low deaths per million rates it doesn't relate to the political philosophy whether it's a conservative mm -hmm. country or a, a liberal country or one that's run by the military. Mm -hmm. Their numbers are low because they shut the friggin' borders. Yeah. A big reason, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're using masks. And, mm -hmm. and as you and I talked about earlier, look it, is there, why not wear a mask? What's the yeah. big deal? And, yeah. you know, I, I find this, I, I watched it, you know, because I lived in the U.S. for 15 years, I'm kind of used to living in the U.S., and, and I, uh, I watched this, and, it, you know, there's something about Americans' belief in their constitutional rights without understanding really what the constitutional rights are. And, you know, it's scary that I know more about the Constitution than the President of the United States. Okay? <laughs> this just scares the hell out of me. Yes. Um, but, and I can pick an elephant out, a sketch of an elephant too. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so any, anyhow, you know, I, um, you don't have the right to endanger the lives of other people, okay? And even even with free speech laws, okay, you can say what you want to say, but inciting violence is illegal, okay? That's, That's right. not part of, of free speech, Yeah. okay? So and in Canada, we have hate laws, which kind of kind of limit free speech to a certain degree, mm -hmm. uh, but but inciting violence it would be a separate thing altogether okay mm -hmm. so the u.s you could say things like well i don't really like muslims in canada if you said that you might get charged with hate speech um in, in the u.s and canada if you said i think people should go out and shoot all muslims you should be in jail mm -hmm. and you would be okay yeah. i mean that's inciting violence um and but of course there were good people on both sides. Uh, <laughs> I just watched I just watched the news and you know what I watched the news from the far left to the far right and I, I and when I say far left I don't watch the entertainment on Fox I actually watch like Chris Wallace and real journalists okay and when I watch CNN I, I try to listen to real journalists all these people have become pundits now instead of reporting the damn news yeah um, well, it's like they're, you know and, uh, there's um, I can't remember the exact title of the book Matt Taibbi from uh, Rolling Stone or he used to be in Rolling, from Rolling Stone he uh, wrote a book about how uh, the uh, two factions of the news media the, you know Fox and uh, you know, the uh, CNN and MSNBC and all that, they basically are, like, you know, try to boost their ratings by, you know, manufacturing hate against the other guys, you know. And they're each doing yes. that. It's yeah. just a different group that they try to get you to hate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and, uh, and, well, you know, it, 
And I actually, when I read, though, I read, I actually, I don't read, um, I, I read a lot of the international news. Mm -hmm. And and so, uh, you know, a lot coming out of the BBC mm -hmm. uh, and a lot coming, and then I watch, you know, Canadian news. And the BBC and Canadian news tend to be more obje objective. In, mm -hmm. in, in terms of, they just kind of report the news, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and they don't editorialize as much as, as you, you know, I see in the U.S. But one thing I can tell you is that, um, and, but the other stuff I read is, like, I'll read National Review, okay, to get the conservative point mm -hmm. of view, but written by real journalists, okay, right. not written by, like, pundits. And I'll read the liberal side of things as well that's written by real journalists, not by pundits. And then, you mm -hmm. know, the reality is somewhere in between when you kind of, you know, try, you, you well. try and balance this stuff out to try and figure out what's going on. But I don't think that Americans understand how foolish the United States looks on the international stage right now because of the bozo you guys have as a president. Yeah. And the 33 percenters, <laughs> the 33 percenters, you know, they'd like want to, you know, use their second, second amendment rights to, uh, take me out. And, th and they also don't know that the second amendment is the right to an organized militia that keeps and bears arms. I, don't know of a militia that involves one person. Last time I checked, there were a few people in a militia. And <laughs> yeah. that was put there so that you could overthrow a government that was corrupt. It mm -hmm. wasn't put there so you could go out and, you know, have like gunfights with other people you don't like. Uh, so <laughs> so they misinterpret their Second Amendment rights anyway. Uh, well, the just, NRA I mean, is really good at getting people to misinterpret their Second, Second Amendment rights. Yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, pertinent to uh, you know people's reaction to COVID, you know, it's just this very, it, I don't know if there's any country that's even close to the United States in terms of just the individualistic, you know, I'm going to do my own thing and fuck you, you know, Wild West mentality. Um, so, you know, to, well, people, that, that's all because people believe it's their constitutional right to do whatever the fuck they want. Yeah. And it's not. It's not. You cannot endanger the life of other, the lives of other people. Yeah. And so, the, so if, if, if there's a law in there that says you have to wear a mask, then you're breaking the law if you don't. And mask use seems to... Because, you know, this is really hard for me to say because, I, as I said before, we know absolutely nothing about the true infection rates, okay? Right. But but better safe well, than we, sorry. So we do, we do know mask, death rates, though. What's the big deal? What's the big deal about yeah. wearing a mask that violates my rights? I, you'd want me to wear a mask, you know? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Uh, but it, we do have an it, exception it, to the rule in the United States, as I was talking with you about before, uh, we um, started recording, uh, you know, Hawaii has, you know, an extremely yeah. low um, death rate well, and that's, probably infection and as, we, as we talked about before, because there's a, they're isolated and no one's going there and no one's leaving. And also, uh, you can tell people about the study we're talking about doing and they would be more of a collectivist society than the yeah. rest of the United States. Yeah, as... Uh, yeah, you know, in Hawaii, uh, you know, there's this culture of aloha, which uh, you know they use it to say hello and goodbye. But what it really means is, uh, you know, I respect you as a person, even if I don't know you, and so I want to do what's in your best interests. Uh, so you know, collectivism basically, um, and so people look out for each other, and that includes things like you know, if they're in a crowd, they they wear masks. Uh, you know, they don't go out if they're sick, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, I've looked at, uh, like, every image I've seen of uh, people in Hawaii during the pandemic where they were in, you know, a crowded public space, just like you find in, you know, Japan or China or Hong Kong or wherever. You know, everybody's wearing a damn mask. Um, and, you know, it's because 
you know, people recognize, hey, you know, if, if we're going to deal with this, I've got to look out for my neighbor. I mean, I can't just yep. be, you know, like, out for and, myself. And a lot of places, a lot of places that have, I mean, my observation was that most of the places that have low death rates are more collectivists and and the places with the higher death rates are more individualistic. Mm -hmm. um, but as, as an aside here, uh, uh, this probably won't interest your viewers, that, you know, this time, this, this time series we're talking about before, we should, those would be easy data for us to collect too, is mm -hmm. we should just be able to look at when masks were introduced at yeah. each point in time at a bunch of countries. And yeah. if we show a big drop in death rates, because that's the only thing we can measure because we don't know what the infection rates are, then it says mask use. There's no arguing that ma at that point that mask, mask use is ineffective. Yeah. Uh, um, and it's yeah, a it's it, uh, publication, too. One objection I got uh, from somebody you know, uh, about uh, you know, the, the you know, mask issue was uh, they said, well, look, you know, we can't do a you know, obviously it wouldn't be ethical if we think that masks might save people's lives to do a controlled experiment, you know, randomly assign people to wear masks in public or not. So all we've got is correlational data. And he said, you know, causation doesn't necessarily mean, uh, co correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. You know, he probably learned that from his intro psych class or whatever. Well, I mean, um, I'm not, but I, I'm not, I'm not going to argue with him there. He's right. Yeah, but, but we've got we've got enough. We have enough. Uh, we have the ability now to do uh, you know multiple time series with sw switching replications. Mm -hmm. that, we, that there's no way you could argue anything else other than mask use causes a decrease in death rates if yeah. that's what we found and yeah. i don't think those data are really hard to collect it's yeah. an afternoon worth of, of finding when masks were introduced at each place and yes before the mass death rate and after the mass death rate Pretty yeah easy. <laughs> yeah i actually came across a study here uh, i think it'll show up on the screen if i just switch desktops here um uh this study, which I'll put in the description of the video, uh, it's titled Face Mask Wearing Rate Predicts Countries' COVID-19 Death Rates. And so basically what they did was they looked at, uh, they tracked death rates over time and they tracked, uh, you know, when people started wearing masks in different uh, countries. And uh, they also looked at, uh, you know, when laws were introduced uh, requiring people to uh, wear masks in public. So, for example, in New York, um, they took a lot of other measures uh, in late March, like closing the schools and closing down, you know, um, a lot of businesses and so forth. Uh, but they didn't require mask wearing in public until uh, I think it was April 17th. And, uh, you know, they also found you know, similar uh, data in um, Italy and I think one other place. Um, and so, you know, they found that... Uh, Okay, well, the quarantine uh, measures had some effects. Uh, they stopped the uh, virus uh, rates from you know, totally spiring out of control, the known infection rate. Well, um, we but they don't didn't know what they are. Well, but I mean, you know, like, you know, you it also, slowed it down a little bit as far as the number of positive tests that were coming up each yeah. day. But the real uh, rubber uh, met the road in New York City on April 17th when they introduced uh, mandatory mask wearing uh, in public. And at that point, the number of deaths uh, per day and the number of known uh, new infections per day uh, took Drops. a nosedive. Um, so you know, that's a pretty good indication that you know, mask Can wearing Can you send me the citation for that? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, yeah. Uh, I, will, I will do that. Um, you don't need to pull it up on the screen. You did a pretty good job of explaining it to people. Yeah, yeah, but I will put the put a link to the video in the uh, description or to the study, I should say, in the description of the video. You and need also, to send the link to, this link to me too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, I can join your channel. Yeah, uh, and I will also, if I can figure out how to do it, uh, you know, maybe I could put it on a web page. Uh, I'll uh, link somehow to uh, a 
you know, copy of your uh, to be published paper so people can look at that as well. That's um, fine with me. Okay. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think uh, what, uh, well, just generally, what, like, you, why do you think uh, the virus got so completely out of control in certain places in the world? Just. You know, because they didn't close down their borders. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is this is all the explanation I can come up with. Yeah. Uh, I actually don't talk about that in the paper because that didn't that didn't hit me until somewhat. I, I, maybe I did talk about it. I don't know. But it didn't hit me until somewhat later when I kept following the data from these different countries and mm -hmm. looking at them being stable. Because see, my argument was that you really can't con con start talking about reopening your economy until your death per million rate has stopped increasing by like, you know, four deaths per million per day. So right. once you get to a point where it's, they're increasing by, you know, half a death per million per day or something like that, then you're at a point where the real curve has stabilized. Mm -hmm. Let it be stable for three months and then start reopening your economy in a systematic and scientific manner and you know Angela Merkel uh, you know I gotta give Angela Merkel credit first of all uh, she managed to keep the EU intact while it came under attack by uh, two of the world's most worst politicians Donald Trump and Boris Johnson <laughs> okay she managed to keep the EU intact she stabilized. She was it was the first company and country in the Western kind, the Western sort of society, more like North American part of Western Europe. Okay, she stabilized um, COVID nineteen uh, rates at around eighty five deaths per million, and she had them stable for a couple of months, and mm -hmm. then started to try to reopen. The, uh, the reopen the economy in a systematic scientific manner. They did the same thing in South Korea, and as soon as they did it, they got spikes. And I don't yeah. exactly know what the spikes truly represent, but they were certainly getting more positive tests. Okay. Yeah. So, so I've got the data for Germany up off. here. Yeah, I've got the data for Germany up here, and I, you know, I guess they managed to get it under control pretty quickly because it went from eighty deaths per million to 100 and deaths, 10 deaths per million. So they're still doing pretty well compared to, you know, the UK or the US or what have you. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and but they had to revert. They had to, like, they had to go back and because, back to shut, more of a shutdown mm -hmm. because their death per million rate, or not, uh, actually, their death per million rate started to increase. You know, they were talking about spikes in infection rates because they seem to be getting more positives. But I just looked at their deaths per million, and yeah, they went up a bit. But they actually they didn't go up a massive amount. But but she was erring on the side of caution. Same thing happened in Korea, South mm -hmm. Korea, because what they did was they reopened the clubs and they had some people who were positive who were out to the clubs and all of a sudden they got these spikes. It right. really didn't affect their deaths per billion rate almost. It went from five to six. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was, was that, yeah, maybe that was because it was mostly, that. was that mostly young people going to the clubs? So, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. And so um, most of the, you know, that, so a lot of them aren't going to die. They got pretty good immune systems anyway. Yeah. So, but they they scaled back. Now in Canada, I think we're moving too fast. Uh, they're at least trying to do it systematically. But you have to understand that our premier, which is like a governor down there, managed to graduate from grade eight, oh, eighth, eighth grade. Okay, <laughs> big diploma. On it. Uh, I, I'm being serious. Um, uh, our Minister of Health has a law degree. God knows why she's Minister of Health. Uh, um, yeah, maybe he'd put somebody who something about health in his Minister of Health. But, uh, we well, have a here in the United States, uh, Mike Pence, who I don't know what the hell he has a degree in. He's in charge of the Coronavirus Task Force. But he's definitely yeah. not a I medical mean, I, doctor I just, or I, scientist or anything. 
<laughs> and okay, you got the 33 percenters. They're going to listen to everything that Trump says. They're not going. Mm -hmm. They're going to ignore Fauci. Okay, Fauci's actually a bright guy, mm -hmm. and 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 then Trump slaps them, uh, you know, all the time. And so that's again, as I said to you before, it's going to increase the average IQ of the world. The people <laughs> that listen to the Trumps of the world are going to die, and the average IQ <laughs> goes up. Also, the average age rate is going to go down because it's mostly old people are dying. Yeah. And that gets back to the study Hopefully we were talking we'll... about doing, right, is, is that... Uh, so the average age goes down, the average intelligence goes up, and... Uh, <laughs> well. Hopefully and, and, we'll. Uh, uh, the world's a better place, I suppose. <laughs> like, I guess, but, but hopefully you know, we'll get things the, under control enough so that we won't see major changes and <laughs> like the. Uh, well, no, but, yeah, but here's the here's so the forth. thing: is that that most of these deaths have occurred in in. Uh, oh, just a second! I just need to answer this real quick. Okay. Uh, hey, Nor. Hey, can can we talk in about twenty minutes? Okay, take care. Bye bye. Okay. Anyway, uh, so I, well, so so it's all these like societies like Canada and the U.S. where we throw all of our old people in old age homes okay, and then the infection ravages damn the old age homes and all these people die. Yeah. So people like my mom who are eighty five years old and living at home don't have to worry about this kind of thing, right? right. Um, yeah, my mom is in a nursing home. She's got Alzheimer's, so it'd be very difficult for us to take care of her at home. But she got yeah. COVID, as did a number of other people in the home. And fortunately, she's okay. But, uh, That's um, good. you know, uh, even though they obviously weren't going anywhere, you know, the staff who were trying to be careful, but, you know, some of them got it. They were coming in and out. Um, and, yeah. you know, as you know, that happened uh you know, all over the United States, it happened a lot in uh, Quebec, Canada. especially. Canada, Canada got killed by it. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, there were two really big uh, mistakes that or issues that came up uh, here in uh, with New York, with a, you know by far the highest death rate in the United States. One is you know they didn't shut down their borders, so people were coming in and out a lot, and. Cuomo, the governor of New York, actually sent people he knew were te positive for COVID into nursing homes. Yes, <laughs> so, that's not very smart. That wasn't yeah. very smart. Yeah, so but I think it's something like 10,000 people in New York nursing homes died. Um, yeah. So. Well, we had, we had, most of the deaths in Canada have been in nursing homes or mm -hmm. they're people with compromised immune systems. Right. It's like I talked about before. If you compare this to the guesses on the Spanish flu to the exact numbers or almost exact numbers we have on mm -hmm. COVID-19, COVID-19 is just as contagious but far less deadly. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I uh, the problem in the U.S. I see – and a little bit here in Canada, is that, well, way more in the U.S., is that everything's being done in an absolutely haphazard, uh, non-systematic, garbage manner that has the potential. Like, I mean, look, California just, like, what their, the number of positive cases that they've detected just went through the roof yesterday. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, people want to talk about the second wave. This isn't the second wave. This is just stupidity. <laughs> yeah, we never took, the ended, the we never ended um, the first wave. We never ended the first wave. The second, this is all part of the first wave. The yeah. second wave, if, and, you know, who knows if we're even going to get a second wave. But the second yeah. wave, what, could have, what would happen if the second wave hit at the same time as flu season, as some people are predicting it will be? Mm -hmm. And what if the second wave... That the virus is mutated, so it's more deadly. It's not very deadly right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Spanish flu actually hit in three waves. If you read some of the history, they say two. But it was really the American flu, not the Spanish flu. We'll just mm -hmm. make that point again. Yeah. So the American Spanish flu hit uh, in three waves. All three were in, in 1918. But the one that that seems to have caused, caused the most deaths was the second wave, okay? And that's the worry with COVID-19 yeah. is that 
two worries. One, it mutates so it's more deadly, and two, it hits at the same time as flu season because people's immune systems are compromised if they got the flu, so all of a sudden you've got this comorbidity thing going on, right? Right. Uh, um, but one thing yeah. that I should, uh, you know, we should try to clarify for people here, we're not saying that COVID-19 is less deadly than the flu. We're saying that it's less deadly, or you're saying that it seems to be, as far as we know, because we don't know the true infection rate, um, less deadly than the Spanish flu in 1918 to 1920, um, yes. where, like with COVID, you know, people had no immunity to it, whereas yeah. with a seasonal flu, um, you know, people we have some immunity to it, and it's not that deadly, um, you know, as far as we can still, tell. Still, you know, I mean, what happens is the death, the death curve for the seasonal flu probably looks like, but we don't know because the epidemiologists use models instead of real data, mm -hmm. it probably looks like this. The mode is up there around 85 years old, and it just drops off, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's just a negative skew. COVID-19 mm -hmm. is going up, you know, and then it's killing people around 85. Then it drops down, and then it goes across, and it comes up again around 40 to 20, but not high, and then it goes down again, and then, then you know, kids. But, mm -hmm. um, but, the, but, but, Again, I hope this is I hope this is a wake up call for people to actually get their flu vaccine. And you know what? Here's the issue: on a good year, the flu vaccine because it's a crapshoot. The flu mm -hmm. vaccine is sixty percent effective. That's a good year. On a mm -hmm. bad year, it's twenty percent effective. But twenty percent is better than zero percent. Exactly. Okay? Exactly. Um, so get your flu shots, everybody. Yeah. Um, so just to uh, kind of wrap things up here um, and we've covered a lot but um, uh, you know, like just in a nutshell uh, what we've talked about is um, that these epidemiologists uh, you don't necessarily know what they're doing we don't know the true infection rate the only way to get at that is to do a, a random sample uh, study where we test people um, because right now the studies that we have don't have a very biased, unrepresentative sample of the population, so we really have no and, idea. Well, also we do, and we have no idea what percentage of the population is asymptomatic and, and shedding the virus. Right, right. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I guess the best data we have is from that study of the cruise ship. Um, exactly. But, you know, and that's, that's exactly, a, and, and, and that that and that was a you know. Small sample size, but yeah. you got to look at it and say, "Well, look at there was a there was a substantial percentage of people that were testing positive and fell fine." Uh, yeah. So. yeah, at least at first, I think that about half of the uh, people who tested positive were asymptomatic, and then you know, later it dropped to twenty percent after two or yeah. three weeks who were asymptomatic. But still, that's a lot of people who don't know they're sick. You know, out in the real world and not a cruise ship. Going around infecting people if you're not so just imagine if twenty percent of Americans were asymptomatic. What's that going to do? Mm -hmm. Right? They're going to be walking Infected around shedding this virus everywhere. Yeah, and that's why you should be wearing a mask because the mask the the the, the mask protects you if you're asymptomatic from spewing the virus. Mm -hmm. Right. right. The mask, the, the, the arguments that I've seen is that the ma wearing a mask itself doesn't protect you from getting it. It does what some. It does is if you're positive, it prevents you from spewing it. Right. And it probably I mean, it, does some based yeah. on the stuff you just told me about. So, yeah. Anyway, wear your mask. So yeah. I actually have to run because I've got, yeah. a I've got a meeting. But my my final thoughts on this are everybody out there. Wear your masks. Maintain physical distancing. Don't go into bars. <laughs> Don't go into restaurants. You can't wear a mask if you're eating. Well, you know what? This is what they did in Ontario. They open up the restaurants, but you have to wear masks. And figure out how to eat. Now, if you can go to an outside patio and you're with, you know, immediate family, and the the things are set up, 
six feet away from each other. You wear your mask until you get to your table and then you're fine, okay? Uh, and then you put your mask on when you, after you're done eating and you leave. I don't know how they're doing this stuff with the uh, uh, mask usage uh, inside restaurants in, in Ontario because mm -hmm. I have no intention of going inside a restaurant or a bar. Yeah. Um, and uh, respect, the, respect other people. You're trying to save other people's lives too, not just your own. Exactly. Um, and um, my final final point is this: one of the things I, that I, I found, and I mentioned this to you before, is that that the West doesn't like to admit when it's wrong, so they've sort of <laughs> not paid too much attention to the point that I made about random sample testing. But all right. of the countries in Asia, like you know, India, Pakistan, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, the list goes on and on and on and on. They're interested in this stuff, and they're all the places that have low death per million rates. Mm -hmm. okay? I think you said and Finland was doing a random sample study. Have you heard any more I about that? I thought they were, and nothing. Never saw a thing from it. Yeah, never saw a thing. So, so like it was reported in the newspaper, and that's why I cited it. Mm -hmm. But then nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, and. Uh, and so I, I don't know what went on, but their rates, their, their death rates are pretty damn low anyway. Yeah. Uh, so they're the, uh, more, you know, they're much, much more practicing, much more democratic socialism in places like, uh, Finland, Norway, Denmark, these kind of places that have, have pretty uh, low death rates. Sweden, yeah, but so is Sweden, but, you know, they the just... Swedes did. Yeah. I just don't get it. Yeah. yeah. And right. you know what, Sweden, it's like there's more elk per mile than there are uh, people, okay, per mm -hmm. square mile. Uh, so I, I, I really don't understand what happened in Sweden. <laughs> it must have got into an Ikea plant. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think that the rumor is they were trying for herd immunity, which is just crazy because no place on Earth, as far as we know, is anywhere near achieving that rate of infection. Um, no, I mean, yeah. Fauci made that point pretty damn clear about a month ago, is that it would have to be up to this percentage, and we're down at this percentage. It's not happening. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. uh, don't count on it, and don't count on a vaccine in 18 months, a viable vaccine in, in 18 months. Well, okay, so they got 10 months now. Trump said it's going to be 18 months, so now he's got 10 months. Yeah, we'll see. So have a well, viable, viable I know, vaccine uh, that all around the entire United States in the next 10 months, if I was a betting man <laughs> and, and I was in Vegas and somebody gave me the odds on that one, I know where my bet would go. Yeah. yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, but uh, I know you have to go pretty soon, so I guess we should uh, wrap this up. And as it is, I'm going to have a very large file to upload to YouTube here. So uh, so we'll uh, wrap this up now. Uh, I've been talking to uh, uh, Dr. Bob Sinclair, a uh, social psychologist like myself, who uh, has done some research uh, taking a skeptical look at the methodology of... Um, you know, studies of uh, infection rate of COVID-19 and basically making the point that, you know, without doing random sample uh, testing, testing of a random rather than biased sample of the population, we really have no idea what the true infection rate of COVID is and therefore we have no idea what the uh, actual mortality rate is. Uh, so, you know, we're kind of shooting in the dark and making guesses and, uh, you know, we would be a lot better off if we... Uh, you well, I think we do know what the mortality rate is. I don't think we know what the infection rate is. Well, the mortality rate per million people, but we don't know the mortality rate per uh, number oh, yeah, of cases. Yeah. Oh, for sure. We don't know how deadly it is at right. all, yes. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we would be a lot better able to plan public policy and to see what's happening if we did that kind of research. Um, and, you know, we also have talked about... Um, you know, some of the things that countries have done wrong, such as, uh, you know, uh, or, or just ways that the society is that makes them vulnerable, such as having a lot of people coming in and out of the country or their city or whatever, having a lot of nursing homes uh, um, and, and uh, so forth. But in any case, uh, you know, there are definitely things that we can do to uh, bring this under control. We have a number of examples around the world 
particularly in the Far East, but also in places like Cuba and uh, Finland and other places that uh, you know, have, have gotten this virus uh, you know, pretty well under control. So it's not the case that we can't do it, that we just have to look at what they've done and uh, follow in their footsteps, and we should be okay with this. But you know, who knows what's going to happen in the U.S. or uh, Canada with this. Um, but uh, again, this has been uh, another episode of The Bitter Pill. Uh, and uh, I thank uh, my guest, Bob Sinclair, for coming on and uh, talking about this. And uh, I will uh, see you guys next time. Thank you very much.